Today is the day that I'm releasing the video and I'm putting the final touches on it. Last night, I dropped promo saying that we were making a response. So as I'm putting the finishing touches on this video, I check out the Dudney Animal Hospital Facebook page. It's been privated so nobody can see it, which is very, very sus. Don't worry though, I bulk downloaded everything he's ever posted about two weeks ago, so... I think we're still good. If you're unaware, there was a video made by Liam Sinclair featuring a really cool veterinarian named Dr. Adrian Walton. This video made some pretty strong allegations towards Kevin. Uh, straight up slander, I would say. You know, and if you want to go find the video on your own and maybe, you know, tell me you like it or you don't like it, feel free to. This individual has found a niche that gets higher views than usual as this medical um, miracle worker. So let's, let's bring up the, the elephant in the room. Uh, this is practicing veterinary medicine without a license. When he's doing this procedure, he says, I don't know if it's going to survive or not. Let's just try it. Of course he tries to Dr. Death. Euthanizing animals isn't nearly as easy for us as it is for you. I just call him Dr. Death. Cut that out. It's not his name. His name's Dr. Adrian Walton. The, the politicians, the lawyers are all against the hobby. The one group we should be able to count on is veterinarians. Do you think they're the kind of creatures that people should be keeping as pets? Any snake that exceeds three meters or 10 feet long is probably inappropriate for most of the population. You know, I'm sure that we're gonna have a lot of people um, going through my CV and, and everything I've ever posted online to try and find dirt on me. If you're purchasing a pet, maybe a little bit more thought should be taken other than just handing a credit card online. You can do something about it. Please consider signing this petition to ban online classified sales of pets. You, sir, love to post on social media. Some would say a little bit too much. Don't give up, by the way. It's all about consistency, I've heard from reptiles and research. I nearly forgot about this. I'm sorry. College of Veterinarians of British Columbia have a complaint system that they actually publicize on their website. Dr. Walton agreed that improvements are needed in his recognition of the severity of an animal's condition and deterioration in treatment, particularly it relates to pharmacology, including antibiotic stewardship and use of analgesics. Dr. Adrian Walton will be completing four hours of continuing education in pharmacology, including antibiotic stewardship and the use of analgesics post-operatively. I'd like to say that I have had conversations with this individual in the past, and- I'll tell you guys a little story about Adrian Walton. Back in 2013, I had somebody contact me about their collection of snakes being uh, seized. Conservation officers found almost 50 illegal pythons in a home in the Fraser Valley. 46 reticulated pythons, illegal in BC, some as long as four meters, in a house just steps from an elementary school. The BC SPCA says the snakes were kept in good shape, and so the owner is able to keep the 50 legal snakes and find them a new home. As a result, the 46 uh, species that were prohibited and are a high risk to public safety were, were euthanized on scene. Clark is finding it hard to move. On. This was hum inhumane what they did. They could have sent them somewhere else. They could have done a lot of things with the animals. They didn't have to euthanize them on the spot. If it was a dog or a cat, no wouldn't have happened. He says he had a permit for some of those snakes and he's considering legal action. So uh, they went in there. The guy was going crazy. He was very, very upset, very, very worried. But you know, you have a significant authority there saying, hey, we'll just arrest you. Adrian decided that he's going to euthanize them all. So he killed all of his snakes at his house with a heart stick. Before and he could find homes for him, by the way. Justin didn't, 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 didn't do anything. They didn't even try to find homes for him. And Adrian, you did do that. So criticizing me is absolutely outlandish. And guess what else you did? You misidentified animals because your level of expertise is insignificant. And I called out Adrian's uh, clinic and I did a post on Facebook, and I said, what kind of uh, vet would do this? I, I, I condemned him, essentially, because I, I just don't understand that. It, it's like, I always thought, like a vet, you care about animals, and you want to do good things. So, this was really, it just, it was way beyond what I could understand. But then, as you've been doing your research, and people have been contacting us that are live in Canada, and they're afraid, I find out that he kills all sorts of animals on purpose. He works with the authorities, and if you speak out against them, you rock the boat, you're gonna get punished. Several reptile experts in the area actually spoke out against Adrian Walton's killing of these animals. Some of the same people in these articles actually ended up being in the news shortly after. 
A mission man who runs a well-known reptile rescue center is fighting back after being charged with animal cruelty. I do not recommend doing this unless you actually know what you're doing. I have done this many times on snakes. It's resulted in the rescue operator being charged with two counts of animal cruelty and one count of violating the Veterinarians Act. I think they're really baseless, they're unfounded. The SPCA disagrees, saying in a statement, clearly it is not appropriate for any individual without a veterinary license to be performing such procedures. In this case, the manner in which the procedure was carried out could have resulted in the death of the animal. It's also concerning that the operation was done without the necessary pain control, which would have caused suffering and distress for the snake. But the consensus from the veterinarians who have reached out to my office have directly refuted what the SPCA has said the proper procedure should have been here. Hopcraft has a history with the SPCA. In 2015, dozens of reptiles were seized from his mission facility over concerns about their care. And in case anybody missed that, here's our man, Dr. Adrian Walton of the Dudney Clinic in British Columbia, doing his thing. Charges were recommended, but never approved. Hopcraft plans to fight the new charges, saying he has personal history with the person who launched the complaint. Up to about here, there's a build up. He adds the snake seen in the video has made a full recovery. Good news is, all of these charges were dropped. I found something his lawyer actually wrote about this. While we take these charges very seriously, we take the position that this is nothing more than a BC SPCA's attempt to once again slander Mr. Hopcraft in the court of public opinion and try to put him out of business. Anyone that's got half a brain can kind of see this is the direction that Adrian Walton has been going in. And maybe he's just a little wee bit upset that Kevin called him on his shit all those years ago. Let's actually take a look at what Dr. Walton said about us and what Kevin had to say about it. So let's, let's bring up the, the elephant in the room. Uh, this is practicing veterinary medicine without a license. Now, there are things that you can do on your own animals that is legal, uh, but it's a fine line between legal and animal cruelty. Uh, the second is that you are not allowed to work on other people's animals. You are getting financial recompense because the video has got views on a YouTube channel, so you are being paid to do this procedure. Now, I'm not sure if you guys noticed or not, but the two people criticizing us in this video right now, one of them is English and the other one's Canadian. Let's get an American doctor involved with this hot topic. I am Dr. Michael Habib. I am a research associate at the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County, uh, and also have a position with the Greater Los Angeles Zoo Association. I was a longtime uh, herpetology department keeper at the National Aquarium in Baltimore, Maryland Zoo in Baltimore. Uh, I was actually a full-time professor for over a decade and uh, moved over to back to the zoo community fairly recently. Obviously, I was I was upset by the reaction and kind of misinformation that was uh, that was involved in not just the video itself, but also the, the just the general lashback and comments that, that I heard that Kevin was getting. There were threats that seemed to have more teeth to them that were highly inappropriate. Things like. Uh, threatening to get certain uh, lobbying groups basically involved. They didn't actually do, and I'm pretty sure they did that because they, these individuals actually knew there is no legal basis involved. But that kind of thing, of course, is, is the sort of thing you do when you just really want to upset someone and, and hurt someone's business and, and, and hurt the reputation. One, one thing right off the bat is this idea that there's something wrong with or uh, illegal about uh, rendering medical care for animals that you own. In the world of most animal care, that is basically everything from an animal diversity standpoint, at least everything outside of really cats and dogs for the most part, the people who own and care for the animals usually also provide the, uh, some at least of the veterinary care often much of it and what you can't do of course is is utilize prescription drugs without a prescription you still have to you still have to have a veterinarian who prescribes you the drugs and instructs you on their proper uh, usage if you're going to be using pharmaceuticals on your animals but as you and i have discussed and as i fully expected nerd is is receiving all of their pharmaceuticals for use on their animals through approved channels. That is, veterinarians are prescribing them these, these drugs to use 
in the facility in the way they're being used. So, so veterinary, a veterinary consultation has been obtained. Prescriptions have been written. Everything is on the up and up. Yeah, it would be great if, uh, if you know, veterinarians all did all had the proper specialization and as well as uh, ability to do house calls to work on the lapids, for example. But it, that's just not realistic, particularly when you're working with large constrictors or venomous uh, species. There is an understanding that certain, that the responsibility for a lot of the care and even medical treatment and intervention is going to fall on those housing them. You know, he's blindly choosing antibiotics based on what he's got on the shelf, not what's best for the animal. They attacked me with saying that I use what I have. I want to let you know, I do have a couple veterinarians that believe in me. I have access. Many of the same tools and agents and antibiotics that they use. The, the drug that he was using is a drug called gentamicin. And it is a absolutely wonderful drug. It also is severely nephrotoxic. It damages kidney tissues like no other drug out there. It, he hasn't chosen an antibiotic based on cultures from the wound. He's just taking what he's got. I was being ridiculed for using genomycin. I will argue you all day long. If you watched my videos uh -huh. and you actually listened to what I talk about, hydration. I always talk about uh, renal effect. Uh, it's an aminoglide. I always talk about it. So we have amicacin, genomycin. And genomycin is loading dose five milligrams. And then after 72 hours, it's half. And you go for 21 days total period. Maybe I'm sensitive and I don't want to have something bad happen to the uh, renal system, the kidneys, and I still want to only do my injections every three days. How about we use ceftazidine? Baytrol. Baytrol. Yeah. So Baytrol, the, the, the Baytrol, not too long ago, was almost like a go-to drug. Problem is Baytrol only lasts in the bloodstream about 24 hours. It spikes. It's quickly uh, metabolized or drawn out through the, the kidneys and then passed. Uh, Amication genomycin lasts 72 hours as well as uh, cephalosporins and whatnot. Baytrol also, when I'm giving like a large snake, you need a lot of Baytrol because the dose is 15 milligram per kilogram. And some of these vets think it's five milligram per kilogram because there's uh, bone malnormalities with birds if you give it to them, but it's not an avian dosage. Mammals is about 15 milligrams. The first thing you do is you culture it. You, you basically grow it and find out what bacteria are in that wound and what antibiotics you should be using. Because the worst thing you can do is use an antibiotic that has no effect on these uh, the bacteria that's on there. And on that note, Dr. Adrian Walton has actually publicly spoke about the struggles he has with antibiotics in his own practice. One of the problems of being a veterinarian is a lot of people are very resistant to spending money on testing. It's become a bigger and bigger challenge to convince people that there are a stage, a step of things that we have to do to get to a diagnosis. And so one of the more common things we oftentimes deal with is like chronic skin problems or chronic bladder infections. And we send home with antibiotics and it seems to help for a while and it comes back. I'm just gonna start culturing everything before I even give out an antibiotic or I'll give something like Clavamox and hope it works waiting for culture results. From what I just heard, you also use your educated guesswork to determine what antibiotic to use initially. But you just criticized Kevin for that, which I don't quite understand. And, and today I've had two cases of animals with resistant strains of bacteria, resistant to amoxicillin and clavamox, resistant to most of the cephalosporins other than the third generation ceftazidine, amicacin, which I can't even get. Uh, are you able to, get, do we have amicacin? Let me see that. Amic. Wow. That's incredible. <laughs> Lots of them are uh, sensitive gentamicin. The only problem with it is, is I'd have to fry your pet's kidneys to be able to treat them. These are all my standard go-to antibiotics. The only ones that I could potentially use on these one are what are called the fluoroquinolones. Things like marbrofloxacin, enrofloxacin, ciprofloxacin. The problem is, is I don't want to use those antibiotics. We should never use those antibiotics because we should be saving those for humans who are suffering from resistant strains. And I don't understand why a particular 
vet actually said never use enrofloxin, which is Batril, on reptiles because it's better saved for humans. Enrofloxin is great for these guys. Uh, sometimes you have to cut it because it can actually burn some tissue in its uh, concentrated form. But I actually regard my animals probably higher than I regard humanity. So use all the enrofloxin for reptiles because I love them. Here's some sterile water. No. Vitamin C. So if I want to make the bloodstream acidic and help membranes, mucous membranes heal, I might do that. Ooh, vitamin B12. Liquid calcium, like cal uh, calcium gluconate, neocalglucon, any of that stuff. Oh, wormers. We have ivermectin, that's only good for some. I got valbendazole, or albendazole if you want to call it. Fendabendazole and wonderful high-grade metronidazole, which is not just an anti-amoeba or protozoa agent, it's also against anaerobic bacteria. So, did you know, get a ball python, and it gets like infected hemipenes, or we get, you get these really gnarly things, a lot of times that is gram-negative bacteria, but we can treat that with flagell. Dose in pythons, 125 milligram per kilogram. Look, I talked to vets. So I used to have Tufts University would come here, bring all their uh, new uh, class of vet students. We would talk about exotics. Vets talk to me. I can I can sit here and look at an animal and I can immediately go bing, bang, boom, 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 without even doing a lot of that testing because I've done the testing over and over and over again. Yes, doing a fecal, doing cloacal washes, doing lung lavage, any of that stuff, putting on my microscope, looking and looking and looking and learning and identifying parasites and doing all that stuff. I have done it for years. Uh, first he takes iodine and he just paints it. And so what he's doing is he's, he's kind of washing the bacteria all kind of like back and forth over the, where he's going to incise. What you're supposed to do is kind of like do a line here, then a line up here and line here, slowly working your way out. So you push all of the bacteria away from where you're incising. So his aseptic technique on how he applied the iodine was wrong. Okay, I get criticized for swabbing an area. And uh, so I took bobo iodine and I'm swabbing it on that animal, okay? So first of all, you didn't, I actually, I started out with uh, alcohol first, but anyways. What I generally do with a lot of animals, they go into a soak. Don, you see me? Mm -hmm. I use, I do like Nolasan or chlorhexidine soaks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I take the animal and actually put the animal in that, like 20 minutes, a half hour. It's gonna cut down on uh, the ambient bacteria, the, the bacteria is on the surface. And then he starts cutting with a blade that is not sterile. Sterile scalpels. And he's not wearing gloves. <laughs> so. They don't use gloves because they like to get a feel for it. So much to me is feel. I'm a guitar player. Everything is like these little sensitivities. When I got my finger up a snake's butt and I'm dealing with egg bound animals, it's still, you know, largely gram negative, but I clean my hands. What I need to do is I need to feel an opening or a tear in the oviduct where I can touch the granulation of that egg to know if I have my glove on, I'm having a hard time detecting the granulation in the actual surface of the egg. So I'm feeling around, looking for the opening of the oviduct. So, you know, I'm doing this and then a lot of times I use my finger because all the granulation in some cases for these egg bound animals actually starts adhering. And it's, it's uh, rough, it's like pebbled. You can actually see the animal like writhing in pain. You don't need to be qualified to recognize that. I would actually love to know how you go about pinning a venomous snake by the head without it going all willy-nilly like that. It might even make a cool video for your YouTube channel. I can tell you're getting a little bit desperate because you took a shot at us and I don't know, you criticized Brian Barczyk over here, so. Or I don't know, maybe you were inspired by Wiccan's reptile. Keep feathering it. We've learned a lot about reptile pain receptors since then, and we know they feel pain. Now it is challenging to control that because a lot of our drugs don't work as effectively as they do in say mammals, but that doesn't mean that there aren't ways to control it. Subcuticular uh, or sub-Q injections of lidocaine. This is injectable lidocaine, this is a prescription. Oh look, there's more lidocaine. I heard that you don't even use this stuff. They did not provide any form of anesthesia or pain control. Definitely geeked out. We're gonna ease up some of the pain factor to numb this because I have to basically, I have to really clean this out. 
So I'm at Nerd on certain days to film. On the other days, I'm essentially on call for Kevin. And often Kevin will call me in a panic and ask me to come in and film something that he's doing. By the time I get there, Kevin has generally already started the project that he was working on, or he's prepped it, or in some cases, he finished it or he's had someone else film it. Oh, and God forbid Kevin films it on his phone. And remember guys, this is YouTube. This video is not meant to be seen by practicing veterinarians and used as educational tools. And some of you are gonna stick to the argument of we're trying to educate people. Well, I'll tell you what, if you wanna keep that argument, that's fine. Why don't you write to all of these book publishers that put all of these books on Amazon for regular people to buy? I think some of you guys are acting like we are legally required to show you every little bit of what we do at Nerd in our YouTube videos. And a lot of you guys are forgetting YouTube videos are a small glimpse of what we do at Nerd. And same thing goes with Adrian Walton's Facebook channel where he posts videos daily, but it's private now. He shows you just the bits that are exciting and just the bits that are worthy of his audience seeing. And he's not legally required to show it to you, nor are we. At the end of that one where they're operating on that long nose viper. It's a flat nose viper. Um, at the end, he shows like literally the, the things like so. W would that have been closed up as a as a vet? No, we would have sutured it at this bare minimum. You actually have to know proper suture technique to do a basic suture does not take rocket science. You can go look on YouTube to ridicule me for not suturing something that I did not feel needed, and I've done it over and over again. I have removed maybe over a hundred subcutaneous parasites over the years in all sorts of different animals, largely uh, tropical Asia, okay? A lot of times they get all these subcutaneous things and green tree pythons and whatever. So a lot of times I can just nick between the uh, scales. A lot of times it involves very, very little blood. You can pull these things out. You watch me do it with Lilith. You watch me do it with Lucifer. You watch me do it with a flat nose viper. All right, here she is, but I don't really want to look at her too hard because I'm still struggling with her. Uh, this is definitely a life situation. She's been going through a lot of antibiotics. All right, guys, for anybody that thinks that this boa is not mine, uh, Kevin Johnson gave it to me. He's just like, he felt terrible. So this is now my burden. It's a daily thing. You're constantly having to fiddle with it and uh, trying to get behind it. But if I were to try to keep her on excessive antibiotic therapy, yeah, there's gonna be uh, challenges to the renal system. Basically, as animals age, their kidneys start going south. Uh, they just, you know, their ability of the kidneys to do what they're supposed to do uh, lessens. So I would only accelerate that. And uh, so right now, I'm just gonna kind of work with her and we'll see what happens. And I will say, Let's say you need a euthanizer. What we do, then you can bring it to any vet because they're gonna do a heart stab on it. They're gonna give her a, they're gonna OD her, her on barbiturates. Here's my garter snake that was hauled out of hibernation by some rodent, some animal, and it's regranulating. So this was just a, a wild snake that Tammy found in the road. We were not gonna make a profit on this when we're done? <laughs> oh. Uh, and money is not, certainly not my objective. Uh, I love animals. This guy was just, donated to us and dumped off because he had a uh, infected cloaca mm -hmm. so he's actually shedding right now but let's take a look if you remember he had big terrible problems looks good now oh it looks really good what kind of profit margin are we gonna make on this one zero because he actually gave it to one of my employees uh -huh. <laughs> so this one had a distended cloaca oh i remember this so one. this one's butt was fell out and it was gnarly it, it was all the brown circular one right a lot of necrosis. yeah and i i Left it in water for a long, long, long time. Hey, I also treated it with chenomycin and it's still alive. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I, no, that kills snakes, it fries their kidneys and they die. Uh -huh. I watched Adrian Walton, he knows what he's talking about. Uh huh. <laughs> so this girl had those really, really gnarly uh, rodent bites that, that had like granulomas and they were cystic. I did surgery on that and people were asking, well, why didn't I remove the, the pockets that harbor that. I had actually run out of lidocaine. So I did the initial injection of lidocaine, multiple different injections, then you get like 20 minutes. And then you go and you can, you can start incising the area. And then I realized it was more involved than I wanted to be and I really didn't have enough lidocaine to actually go further. So I ended up just uh, suturing her and stitching her up. I know there's gonna be some really upsetty spaghetti people watching this video. So here's an explanation of why the snake has lacerations on it. So Snarfles inflicted this on him. He's a cutter. These guys knew what to do. They cleaned it up. They blue coated it and he's fine. 
Yeah, that will regranulate. Do not mix a dog or a cat injury with a snake injury. It's a very, very different thing. These are very primitive animals. They're very uh, designed to live in a very harsh world where they have uh, incredible abilities to recover. I actually apologize for this video not going out sooner, but I needed a couple weeks, and if I could have had more, I would have taken it. It takes time to address such serious allegations, and I wasn't about to just let Kevin yell at the camera for five minutes and let it go, because I don't think that would have done this justice. This is the last time I'll ever be making a video about this. We said what we needed to say, and if you're gonna clout chase, I'm not stupid enough to platform you. I gotta turn my camera on, dude. You didn't turn your camera on!